Hello and welcome to the Women's Wellness Podcast. My name is Amy Roper and I am your host for today. And our goal of the Women's Wellness Podcast is to empower women to make informed choices about their health, life and family. And we do that by in- interviewing various experts in their fields to give you as much information as possible so you can make those decisions. Today's expert is Trish Martin. Now, Trish Martin has over 20 years experience working with parents and their babies. She has been a nurse working in obstetrics and maternity. She has also been a plunket nurse, a personal trainer and a relaxation massage therapist. She has a big interest in helping mums, especially new mums, find balance between being a mum of newborn and finding time for herself and she also educates and helps mums to navigate the often conflicting and contradictory world that surrounds postnatal or the postnatal period. So without further ado I would love to welcome Trish Martin to tell us more. Welcome Trish. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to this interview. Great. Um, So I've done a little bit of a brief introduction about you, but it's always best in your own words. So I wondered if you could tell us in your own words what you do, how you got into being a newborn consultant. You've done a lot over 20 years, it looks. Yep. Yep. Yeah, just take as long as you need to. Give us the overview. Okay, cool. Um, well, I mean, I think what a lot of mums first want to hear is, yeah, I'm a mum too. So I have got um, three children. So um, although two of them are now adults, I've got um, two boys, 22 and 20. Um, and um, I've also got a little girl who's 13. And um, my background has been within the actual um, public and private health system. So um, registered nursing, some medical, some surgical but mainly obstetric and maternity nursing. Um, so I've worked with new mums and babies for many, many years. Um, I've worked in special care baby unit. Um, I've actually also done a little bit with um, maternal mental health and also helping um, babies with drug rehabilitation. Right. Um, so I worked on a specialist unit um, at National Women's when it was still the old National Women's in Green Lane. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it's... Um, I've also been a Plunkett nurse, um, but um, sometimes, very occasionally, I say that don't hold that against me because I know Plunkett's very, while they do an amazing job, it's a very different organisation to what it was 25 years ago. Um, And um, so when I was looking at getting back into some me time um, and looking to go back to work after my children, Um, I thought, what do I do? And um, really wanted to go back into nursing, but actually really didn't want to get into that sort of whole political arena of nursing, you know, going back into the hospital, going back into um, a lot of shift work um, and that kind of thing. And so I thought, you know, what can I do to actually have that balance of being a mum at home um, and looking after my children as well as actually um, creating a passion around a business. Um, and so that's when um, Baby Coach NZ or a Newborn Consultant started, which is around about six years ago now. Um, and um, never looked back. Um, it's been an amazing journey. I really, really loved it. Um, and my passion is definitely helping um, mums, particularly with newborns. Um, and um, I think for me, the reason why I also started that little business for me was that um, I'm not while the policies and the guidelines and the recommendations are there um, to help um, new mums in in their families um, it can also hinder Um, they're very conflicting they're very contradictory um, and there's so much information out there for new parents um, that it's really really hard to navigate um, and to actually find you know, information that actually suits um, a mum's individual needs um, in, in the family. Um, so I'm very neutral. I'm very about creating balance mm-hmm. around around parenting styles. Um, but then in the same sort of breath, I also think it's very important to create some really good sustainable patterns. Um, because we as, as human, it's human nature to be able to um, 
you know, we, we actually live on, on habit, um, sort of knowing what to come, you know, knowing what, what, what yeah, so expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, babies are no different. Um, so if, if there's a lot of confusion around feeding and around sleep um, and lack of knowledge and lack of confidence, um, it's very hard to actually create that sort of sustainable um, passion and nurturing when it comes to new mums and babies. Um, so that's probably, yeah, is it probably enough? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I do tend to talk good. quite a bit. <laughs> so you'll have to stop me if, um, <laughs> yeah, if, I'm, going, if I'm going over time. Um, but, yeah, I think probably just the main thing for me is, and the other reason why I started my business is that um, I think with a lot of the information that mums are provided, it's very baby oriented. Um, and I think there needs to be a mum's advocate out there as far as just helping mums um, yeah, nurture themselves as well and create that balance mm -hmm. um, while navigating and transitioning into that parenthood. Um, so it's very important. For me, my philosophy is definitely happy mum, happy baby. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That brings me to a question that I hadn't written down before. I just dotted it down then. Um, yep. you mentioned that you were working with mental health as well. Yeah. Is there, I mean, it's a big topic in itself, but yep. are there any normal things that a mum would go through in the process of getting used to this new birth, newborn baby? Um, and kind of where the line blurs from kind of baby blues to a postnatal depletion, postnatal depression. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very good question. Um, and I think um, that is where the um, confusion lies often with baby blues and postnatal distress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, baby blues is very, very normal. Um, it's actually sort of like it's, we used to call it the third day blues. It's when, um, right. so it's when the hormones um, are changing because Bubs is now out in the big wide world. So all those hormones that you needed around pregnancy um, are sort of, you know, trying to sort of, yeah, figure out what's actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I can remember being in hospital on my when my first baby on the third day blues, and it was actually my birthday, um, and I was just pretty much crying all day. Um, no idea why. <laughs> um, I knew my milk had come in. Um, I knew I had maybe a, you know, a bit of an unsettled baby. Um, nobody had come to visit me yet, but it was only eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. How can we expect someone to come in and visit you straight away at eight o'clock in the morning? But, you know, it's all those emotions. Um, yeah. So very, very normal. And I think um, what often um, is, is challenging is that mums feel that the baby blues continue in, in a week, and then two weeks, and then three weeks. Um, I think that's um, untrue. I think baby blues only last for around about two or three days, the proper baby blues. Yeah. Um, it's when your milk comes in, there's lots of change happening around, around that time. Um, once you start to get into feeling that you are not good enough, you're second guessing yourself, you're starting to feel sleep deprived, um, you're feeling that you are unable to feed your baby well, you haven't got enough milk, um, you're not bonding with your baby, all those sort of things. Um, if that's over a week, if they last for over a week, then I would definitely start to look at postnatal anxiety and postnatal um, distress leading on to postnatal depression. Um, and a lot of mums tend to get diagnosed with postnatal depression often around about between four and six weeks. Okay. Um, but that is when all that anxiety and all that sleep deprivation, um, all that uncertainty and second guessing themselves has actually lasted for too long and they haven't had, had the correct help that they've needed early on. So what could, what could they do and what could their closest friends and relatives, like their partners, their parents, their community, what could they do to support or ask for help. So if they yep. well, I think, can I ask for help somewhere else? Yeah, absolutely. I think and I think that's the struggle with a lot of new mums. They they don't feel um they want to ask for help. Um I think probably deep down they do want to, but um it's a notion as far as you know a mum needs to cope. Um mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the information and advice out there as well as far as um sleep deprivation is normal when you have a newborn. 
Um, I think that's probably the worst advice. But when a mum starts to feel sleep deprived, they will hear from others um, that, you know, this is all normal. It's a phase. Just just cope with it. Um, okay. It'll get better. Um, and to me, that's actually not the best advice, um, especially for a mum who has already had challenges with possible anxiety and depression before they've had baby. Um, so we really need to recognise, you know, their, um, their pre, um, predisposing factors for them as well. Um, learn to say yes um, instead of no. <laughs> um, and you can start practising that when you, you know, are already pregnant, when people are asking you, even just before your baby's born, what can I do to help? Um, yes, you can help me with, you know, preparing meals, clean my house a little bit. Um, just little things that really, really will help you in the long run. And um, especially in the early days when you are in hospital, um, ask for help. I, I, I say it to a lot of mums, sit on that buzzer and ask for help. Even though some staff will say, actually, you know, we are short staffed, we, we can't help you. A lot of mums are getting very much left to their own devices um, mm -hmm. for a very long period of time. Um, but allow yourself to actually... You know, ask lots of questions and ask for help is very, very important. Are there any good support lines or people, um, like official counsellors and people who you can recommend for postnatal um, anxiety? I personally, you know, um, I probably do, and I could probably put them in. I could probably give them to you as far as the yeah. names would like. Yeah, coming to me. Yeah. Um, I know there's a couple out there, definitely. Um, there is always um, the Plunkett um, centres, you know, Plunkett Healthline. Um, definitely ask your midwife or your lead maternity carer um, in the first six weeks. They should be there for you to ask, you know, if you've got any questions. Um, and, um, yeah, and I think it also, for mums not to be afraid as far as if they are being diagnosed with anxiety or depression, that going on medication is absolutely okay, but it is not the only thing. I think there needs to be a change in patterns. There needs to be change in in feeding and help with newborn and help with you know bubs. Um, because if you the the cause of the depression and the anxiety is usually from a a worry or something that's happening and that's occurring, um, and so we need to change that to actually you know help mum. Um, yeah. Better cope with the anxiety. Yeah, um, yeah, and and that's and that's often what I'm finding. What's that? I suppose it's like wanting to be in control and thinking you should have everything together, but then collapsing when you don't have everything in control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite natural to have some of those days. Um, I think we all have those days. Um, but I do struggle sometimes when mums are heading off to the um, to their doctors. Um, and they are put on medication, but they're actually not looking at why this is occurring. What's what's actually happening around it? Um, and, and yeah, so we do need to look at the bottom of certain things um, and how that yeah how that's come about is really important. And I would say through my work in helping um, parents with newborns, um, it is very much about sleep deprivation. Um, it's about um, you know how baby is feeding, how mum is feeding, um, and um, a lot of these mums are not trusting their own intuition, um, not trusting their gut instinct, and so they're on um, Google and they're on mummy forums asking lots of questions. And um, I always say to mums, what your norm is and not somebody else's norm. Um, so be very careful how you ask the questions um, and, and how you take on board the advice that others are giving you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you do your workshops, um, I was looking at the newborn preparation workshop yep. you've got coming up. Yep. Um, by the time this goes live, it might be past, but we'll have another one coming up. On yeah, but we'll definitely have another one. Yep. Perfect. Um, so is that one of the topics that you would cover in that workshop? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's um, yeah, creating some um, confidence around mums. Um, I think for me also being a, um, a nurse and got my nursing background, um, I look at 
the whole baby's development, what baby's actually doing, um, what reflexes are at play when baby's actually feeding and sleeping, um, expectations around you know the first hour, the first 24 hours and 48 hours. Um, and this is especially so with, with breastfeeding. Um, I know there's so much so much push for mums to breastfeed, but they're actually, for me, in my personal opinion, um, they're actually doing it in the wrong way. Mm. Um, there's too much pressure. And so it's sort of like, it's, yeah, so mums are feeling lost and, um, they, yeah, they're feeling overwhelmed and they're feeling anxious. Um, and then again, they start to second guess themselves and not, you know, trust um, what's, what, yeah, what's good for them. So, um, this newborn prep class is all about actually information that you often don't get in antenatal mm -hmm. um, and is often missed when you um, have had your baby um, and you know your baby's two or three weeks old. The reason why I started them is when I do do classes um, from two weeks to 12 weeks, a lot of mums, especially with those early newborns, are saying to me, why did we not get told this in antenatal? All right. Um, and there is a couple of reasons why often this is not discussed. It's because there is so much around the birth, yeah. um, you know, and so, so if you're discussing lots of other things after the birth, you may forget or that's, it's too much information. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important that there is a little bit of um, knowledge there so that when things do occur, it actually jogs a memory. And actually, your memory comes back and goes, actually, that's what Trish spoke about. This yeah. is what's happening. I can now sort of like, you know, do some steps towards finding a solution um, to, yeah, to something that's, that's not quite working for me. Um, so, yeah. So how early or, I should say, how, what stage of the pregnancy do you recommend that they can do? these workshops and these courses? Um, so I, I guess it's just really up to the individual and how, how well they, you know, what, yeah. Um, I've got mums, I've just had my class last Friday. Um, so I've had 20, so 10 couples, 20. Um, so I get dads included as well because I think it's very important yeah. that dads are on the same page or um, partners, whoever that may be. Um, and um, I think, yeah, I mean, the ideal is around about 34 weeks onwards. Okay. So when you're actually in your antenatal class or you're just about to start your antenatal classes um, and, you know, your baby is not far away from being, um, yeah, from being due. Um, however, I've had mums coming that, that 20 weeks pregnant um, yeah. or, you know, 30 weeks pregnant um, and they've thoroughly enjoyed um, the class and they've already had questions that mm -hmm. they've now been answered as far as now that they've joined, yeah, and they've come to the class. So, mm. And is it a one-off class or is it a block of so many? Um, it's definitely um, just every two months. Um, so, okay. yeah, so every month. So the next class is in March. So keep an eye out as far as for when that class will be. Yeah. Um, so I will be doing those every two months. And um, I've also got a Creating a Confident Sleeper class as well, which generally will either be every month or every two months as well. Okay. So, yeah. And you work... Um, one-on-one -on -one with people as well or is it just workshops? yes yep absolutely yep so um that's what i enjoy the most um is um i absolutely enjoy the classes but i love working one-on-one -on -one. Yeah. um it's yeah going into the home um starting and looking at even setting up in the nurseries um you know looking at what they need for their hospital bag um baby products um you know things like that and then actually following through um just just as baby is born within the 48 hours, um, working with them, um, even visiting them in hospital, um, helping them with feeding um, and lactation and things like that. Um, and then on from that, they have home visits as well as weekly calls um, up to six weeks or up to um, 12 weeks. I've got coaching packages. Um, so yeah, so it's, yeah, so I do like, and, and there's like a couple a of rescue like packages as well. Yeah, it is like a post. It's like a postnatal doula, right? Yeah. So, um, but I think the the word doula is is quite new in New Zealand. It's yeah. been around for a while internationally, yeah. um, but it is quite new. But yeah, it's it's a it's a newborn support person um, that right. that helps you transition through those first you know early weeks. Mm, that sounds ideal. 
That sounds perfect. Oh, I'm just imagining yeah. that. it's my turn. Right, I'm going to book you in. <laughs> um, you mentioned helping with lactation and breastfeeding. And you mentioned earlier that the milk tends to come in about day three. I've no yep. I know from movies, at least, that someone will have the baby and they go right straight to breast. Um, yep. What do they get then? Is it... Do they get anything? The, the colostrum, so the colostrum is first. So okay. that is the very first fluid. Yep. So right. that's the yep. very first milk is colostrum. And yep. it's quite a um it's quite a thick, sticky, yellowish sort of like um yeah, milk that the babies get first. Yeah. Um and the reason for you probably you're probably talking about the first hour as far as getting baby yeah. on in the first hour after delivery. Um and the reason why that's really, really important. Um, is to actually get this um, prolactin hormone starting because prolactin is actually the one that produces the milk. Yes. Um, so the earlier we start and the earlier that we get actually bubbles on, um, the yeah, the you know the better the chance as far as getting that lactation going and starting. Um, I will say that it is not, it's not for me personally. I'm working with mums. It's not crucial that a baby gets on in the first hour. Um, it, in an ideal world, that would be great, but we've also got to take into account as far as what kind of delivery mum's had, yeah. um, you know, how exhausted mum is, you know, it's, I always look at the wider picture, um, and yeah, so, um, and it's, it sometimes can be very normal if a mum is so, ex so exhausted after having a very, very long labour that she actually doesn't feel like bonding with bubs right there yeah. and then within the first, you know, few minutes or, or hour um it, it can take time mm. so yeah and then the and then the milk and then the milk starts to change and it comes in around about day three day four and um how common are tongue ties and lip ties oh um that's an interesting topic i um i, I guess from a, a I, I'm seeing, and I'm not saying that there is no tongue tie. There is definitely babies who struggle with tongue tying, definitely, yeah. and it definitely always needs to be checked um, by a person who can actually tell, you know, yeah. if like a midwife or another, you know, a doctor or whatever. Um, I definitely do check, um, but if I know that there is a, a tongue tie involved, then I will refer on yeah. because I'm not a lactation consultant as such, so I will keep my breastfeeding support very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and if there is anything else that I think I need to refer to, I, I definitely will. Um, but I do um, find that a lot of the um, tongue tie challenges could be le could be from actually not good enough breastfeeding support, um, and mums actually not um, being taught how to breastfeed. Right. Um, for me. Um, Yes, breastfeeding comes naturally, but it's also an art. Yeah. And sometimes babies actually don't know what to do. Yeah. And they actually need to be guided. Yeah. Um, and so I think sometimes mum's actually being left alone too long um, without that support. And then they're struggling um, with breastfeeding. Um, baby's not latched on properly. Um, and yeah, all sorts of things start to occur. And then it's possibility that there may be tongue tie when in actual fact it's actually... Um, yeah, baby's not on correctly, um, and or the mum's not positioned correctly. Baby's not positioned correctly, um, so yeah. So it's like everything; it's a skill that needs to be learned. Yeah, I, I personally think it is. Um, some babies take to breastfeeding very quickly and are very good at it. Um, others definitely need, um, yeah, and with mum as well. It's it's, a, it's yeah. a, so such a new thing for mum too. So I think yeah, it, it's. It, there needs to be a lot of support and that's and that's the challenge what I find um, when I used to work as a, um, a maternity nurse in the hospital um, mums weren't allowed to go home until they established breastfeeding right so that was day three day four when the milk came in mm -hmm. um, whereas now you know a lot of mums are home after four hours um, yeah. I mean I've even heard you know stories of mums actually going out of the hospital at 2am in the morning getting home Absolutely, just yeah. After long labours, wow. um, with with no support, um, and that's really sad. It's mm -hmm. it's, and I think you know a lot of the 
a lot of the challenge with breastfeeding, especially with sore nipples um, and things like that, um, happens within the first 48 hours. Yeah. Um, and some of that can definitely be prevented with support and guidance. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just looking at my questions, thinking when you when a mum goes home and there hasn't really been that support or guidance and all of a sudden they're home and it's two o'clock in the morning and the baby's yep. crying and they're doing how how long does it take to kind of tune in to what a baby wants and what each cry means and how do you not lose your mind in the first oh. in the first few hours <laughs> crying um i would say that's a huge question and yeah. um yeah it's i to be, to be honest, I think um, I think the challenges that mums have is because there is a lack of knowledge on how babies develop and and what's what's the physiology and the anatomy and things like that of babies. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you one example. It's probably a really easy example um, yeah. that you can that mums can relate to, is that we often hear. Um, the top advice as far as feed your baby whenever they cry. Okay. Um, and so it's really challenging for mums because babies cry for also all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Not necessarily hunger. Yeah. Um, way yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is pretty hard to actually recognize a baby's cry really early on. It takes some time. It, it can take a few weeks. Yeah. Um, but babies actually have a involuntary sucking reflex. Um, which means that their palate and their lips, whenever they are touched, they will suck. And so babies actually learn this at 32 weeks of age um, in the womb, at 32 oh. weeks pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's when the sucking reflex around about then starts to occur. And it gets really well developed around about 36 weeks. Yeah. Um, so it starts around 32 weeks, gets really well developed at 36 weeks. Um, so babies will... Um, suck for hunger they will suck if they've got wind they will suck if they're tired um, they will suck due to development um, so it's we've really got to look at as far as giving mums information to actually help them step by step recognize mm. what you know what their baby's needs are um, and for for a lot of people to say just feed whenever your baby looks hungry or is sucking or is crying yeah. um, can become quite challenging yeah. um, because if a, if a baby's got a really, really full tummy and consistently is um, being, trying to feed mm -hmm. and offering food, um, it then can become quite um, sore. It's got sore tummy, it's got more wind, then it gets more reflux, then right. it has less sleep. And it's just the whole cycle just yeah. goes on and on. And, and before you know it, you've got a very tired mum a very tired baby because I believe babies actually do get sleep deprived as well, as well as mums. Um, so it's, and, and that's what I talk about, especially in my um, newborn classes mm -hmm. about the sucking reflex. It's not necessarily a hunger reflex. Um, the rooting reflex, which is the babies when they actually get brushed on the side of their cheek, they will turn. Oh. Um, is not a hunger reflex. Right. Yeah. Um, it's there even if they've got a full tummy. Um, so it's, Ooh, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, babies even do that when they're absolutely chock a full and their tummies are absolutely just, they couldn't fit any more food in. They will still root, um, because it's actually an involuntary reflex. It's there. Yeah. Um, and it is, it is a survival reflex, but it's actually there even if they're not hungry. Right. Um, so it's really important to just, and, and they're such simple little things, but that's, this is not what mums get told. Yeah. Um, so learning your baby's cues, really, really important. Um, your baby's cues, such as um, grizzling, um, lots of jerky movements of the arm and legs, arching of the back, um, all those baby cues are exactly the same for hunger, for wind, for pain, and for tiredness. So again, it needs to be mum's intuition and yeah. um, natural instinct, knowing that actually I have fed bubs really, really well. They've had a really good feed, but still half an hour afterwards, they're still showing me those signs. Mm. So it's process of elimination. Um, okay, I've fed bubs, they can't be hungry. What's next? 
I've changed a nappy. They've got a clean nappy. Yeah. Um, they've had a bit of wind. What haven't they done over the last hour or two hours or three hours? They probably haven't slept well. They are absolutely exhausted beside themselves. They actually need a good sleep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, giving you time to think, I think, is really important. Um, yeah. For mums to just stop. Yeah. 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 So, mum, for mums to just stop and just take three seconds, five seconds, and think, actually, what am I going to do next? Yeah. Um, because often we're actually taking action um, without actually thinking. Yeah. So, yeah. And you still go through sleep and swaddling and holding and... Yep, absolutely. Sleep. Everything. Yep, yep, yep. So I take each mum and bubs as an individual. Um, so, I mean, it's another thing as far as you have to swaddle a baby, which I hear often. Yeah. Um, and for me, some babies hate being swaddled. They absolutely just would rather have their hands up in the air, sleeping on their back, um, and yeah. just relaxing without being swaddled. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a, a little Houdini who consistently gets out of their swaddle, um, I say just get rid of it. Yeah. 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 I suppose it's everyone's an individual. Every baby's yeah. an individual. Every mum's an individual. And every yeah. pregnancy is individual. So you could have a perfectly good baby who does everything that you say, everything you do in the first instance, then you get a brand new baby who is the complete opposite. Yeah. And yeah. So you, would you recommend that mums go, new mums or mums to be go and see or go and do a workshop before each Um, I think so what, so for my, from working with clients, from working with mums, yeah. what I generally see the reason for probably either a first baby being challenged and the second baby being really, really good or vice versa yeah. is um, that they haven't had any knowledge in the first baby and so they're just winging it um, mm -hmm. and you know, doing the best they can. Um, and then with the second baby being a good sleeper, they've actually learned from the things that hadn't worked for the first baby. So generally, the second baby is, is a little bit of better sleep because they're not yeah they're not doing as many things what didn't work for the first. The other thing is, um, is when you have a second baby, you don't have the um, the the quick response like you would have reacted to the first baby. So the second baby is always learned to have slightly more patience slightly more resilient because you've got a toddler to look after yeah. yeah and so that is sometimes why a second baby is generally a little bit easier because they've learned to actually be able to have a little bit of time mm. to for mum to think and what to do next like who do i go do first is it the toddler yeah. or is it bubs or yeah. is it bubs is it toddler um and so that so that's sometimes why the other thing, if, if the first baby's been really good and the second baby hasn't been that good, mm. what usually happens in that, in that scenario um, is they've actually reacted to the second baby too quickly because they don't want to wake the toddler up. Right. So it's interesting, there's two, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of some mums don't recognize that they've been doing that because they don't want to wake the toddler up. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually trying to keep the second baby more quiet. Um, and in turn, it's actually backfired on them because yeah, Bubs hasn't become as patient as the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I, there's two quite prominent scenarios that I see occurring when I yeah, work with either first or second, mm -hmm. second babies. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so how would people go about booking you? Is it best through the website to the workshop? Do you advertise through Facebook or definitely? Website? Yeah, I've got a Facebook page. Um, Trish Martin, baby consultant, newborn consultant. Um, come and yeah, look, look me. There's lots of information on there. I have um, frequent Q and A's, um, and I always share lots of information and things like that. Um, definitely they can book I've got a free 15 minute um, chat on the they can actually book in yeah. through my actual website yeah. um, lots of information as far as um, blogs um, and resources and articles for that um, or just yeah ring me give me a call directly 
Um, I'm always keen to chat um, and I'm always, yeah, I'm, I'm always there for mums. Um, I think what sets me apart, which I'm using now within the newborn um, preparation workshop, mm -hmm. is I actually help mums create a postnatal plan rather than a birth plan. Yeah. Um, so it's all about goal setting. It's all about expectation. Um, it's all about what to ask um, after the baby's born and that kind of thing. Because often we can actually control more what's happening after the birth. Your yeah. baby will actually come the safest and healthiest way. Um, and I think sometimes when I work with mums, they've actually set up a really amazing birth plan, um, but it's totally turned to custard. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, and, and to, that can be quite um, hard for some mums to deal with. Yeah, it can create a, a trauma. Absolutely. Everything hasn't gone yeah. to plan. Yeah. You've got birth plans yeah. to deal with. And, yeah. 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 I think, I mean, birth plans definitely have their place, but they're made to be broken. Yeah. So just keeping that in the back of your mind, um, that at the end of the day, you know, if there needs to be an intervention or there needs to be something that for your baby to come out the healthiest and safest way, then yeah, yeah. that's, mm. so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a question and it's just disappeared. So um, your website is at www.fadecoach.co.nz? Yep, that's the one. You can book through there. I, I'm sure my question will pop back in my head. But before we close, before we get to our final question, I've got a few common myths that yep, I yep. hear bandied about different forums and Thing, and I thought I would try you just quick fire like a, a yep. minute or two on each yep. one. So myth number one. Um well, the cord. You need to clean it with antiseptic and alcohol. True or false? I would say it's false. Um, nowadays they just leave it. Um, but of course if it gets slightly infected and things like that, you'll need to go and see a medical um, you get some medical advice. Um, and they might actually give you some, yeah, things just to help it along. But these days, they actually just get left. Yeah. Yeah, left to its own. Thing. Yeah. Um, and I suppose this leads me to the next one. Babies need to be bathed every day. Um, I think that's totally up to the individual. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, whether they get bathed, whether they get you know, put in the bath, whether they get put in the shower... Um, I think it just, you know, as long as it fits in, in the family routine, um, then that's okay too. But it's okay to actually, you yeah, know, bath your baby every second or third day. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's totally up to the individual. I suppose, unless there's daily crew explosions, it's... Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, picking up a crying baby will spoil them. Will yeah, them. that's an interesting one. Um, so you cannot definitely spoil a baby, um, by picking it up too often. Um, I think that, that that's the myth, but you can create an expectation if your baby cries and you pick baby up every single time within seconds, um, that that baby, um, will have a learnt behavior of whenever they cry, they know that they're going to be picked up. And the only reason why that is, is that, for me, babies are very clever. I think we sometimes underestimate how much babies are actually learning mm -hmm. um, and, and mimicking. Um, and um, I read an article um, a while ago, and I loved the way that they said it as far as our brain is, is an association machine. Yeah. Um, and that's the same with adults, even as grown-ups. Um, and so whenever your baby cries and you pick it up every single time, then that baby is going to know that yeah response from that you know the, yeah the action um so that's why i've created the confident sleepers it's not about self-settling it's not about self-soothing it's actually yeah. about helping your baby enjoy where they are sleeping and where they are settling um and so yeah. what what i believe happens yeah yeah what i believe yeah. happens is that whenever you pick your baby up when they're crying out of their bed you're actually telling them that their bed is not a happy place to be in yeah, true. So that's that's my little, yeah. Yeah. Thing. So let them learn the space, learn what is happening. And yeah, yeah. And I think it's also important that we allow babies to actually lie awake in their beds mm -hmm. and actually look around and actually be confident in their environment so they get to know their environment and get to know their bed. Yeah. 
and then there's things like if you're obviously distressed then it's oh totally it's yes, all absolutely. Yeah. Not really common sense. yeah yeah but, you would always respond to a baby but it's how you respond that's the yeah. difference yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's in a nutshell that's, yeah um I may not have enough breastfeed. Breast milk. <laughs> for my yeah. I may not have enough breast milk to feed my baby. Yeah. Um. Yes. T- to be honest, some mums don't make enough breast milk. Yeah. Um. It, it could be just because it's a natural body that they're just not naturally making enough. Um. Definitely, sometimes one side makes more than another. Mm-hmm. Um. I think we also need to look at um like with stress and anxiety um we need to be able to be relaxed and confident for the prolactin hormone to actually work at its best at its optimum um and if we are stressed that actually can work against us and so the yeah. you know your, your lactation may go down um or may not be um at its optimum of what it could be um, and that's where I relate it to with mums are getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of pressure to breastfeed and they're just getting pushed and pushed and they're feeling yeah. sleep deprived. It's actually going to work against them to actually increase their milk supply mm. um, yeah. because stress and breastfeeding are not a good mixture. Yeah. It's like the fight and flight, the sympathetic yeah. nervous system and the parasympathetic yeah. nervous system. That's the, the rest, recover, digest, yeah. create all of that. Or let the body do its thing otherwise yeah. everything shuts down yeah yeah. yeah so the, the common scenario with breastfeeding mums to increase their lactation is the advice to just feed baby feed baby feed baby feed baby right. because obviously the the motion in the the physical feeding mm. and the sucking creates that prolactin mm. but the challenge is is that prolactin also is not working well if there is not enough oxytocin and oxytocin is actually the letdown reflex and is there when a mum's relaxed yeah and it's actually hinders when a mum is stressed and sleep deprived Mm. so they need to work together in unison to be able to work so while getting a baby on frequently and feeding feeding lots may increase the lactation if a mum then starts to get anxious sleep deprived um, and yeah. is totally overwhelmed and beside herself, it could actually go the other way. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's why it's all about it. balance. Yeah. 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 Mm. And last one of the myths, babies need a routine from day one. Hours. I don't think they need, yeah, I, think, I don't think they need a routine from day one, um, but I do think that giving them... Um, a pattern, creating a pattern from around about 10, 10 days to two weeks mm-hmm. um, will help both mum and baby. Um, babies don't do well with confusion. Um, so, and, and I always look at, when I work with mums, um, I talk about what kind of parenting style they would actually like. Um, if it's attachment parenting and it works for them, then that's awesome. If it's routine and pattern-based, then that's awesome too. It's got to work for mum individual mum um but babies do um struggle with confusion so if you are feeding frequently you're putting bubs in different areas all the time you're in and out um and baby actually doesn't know where they you know their bed is and and what time they're going to sleep and that kind of thing um that can be challenging um so actually creating some patterns around sleep and feeding um, actually also helps manage your day as well because I think mums are important yeah. um, so and that's why we need to take each individual mum's personality mm-hmm. um, and what they're used to like if they're a very routine person before baby arrived yeah then it's absolutely okay to be a routine person after baby comes because that's how they're going to function much better because mm. that's the type of personality that they are yeah. um, so it's, yeah, and, and that's what I look at as well, as far as, you know, it's, yeah. So there's never, never one way of only parenting. It's got to fit right. in with your personality, with your lifestyle, your family dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. If you're very routine and strict structure and know how this is going to work and someone says, oh, right now you've got to do it this way. Yeah. You, you get overwhelmed and, yeah, it, it, and then. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Mm. I suppose that goes back to picking up a baby when it's crying all the time and making like that kind of coaching and adding that into the routine of how you communicate with your baby. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of what I hear when I'm teaching mums, they sort of sit back and relax and go, well, that, that's just common sense. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, it does make sense. But I think we lose that common sense in the overwhelm and we've got so much information um, and mums are often Googling, um, reading too many books. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I talk to them about as well is that um, think about how many gadgets you need for your baby. Because if you have too many gadgets, that is actually going to take away from your own intuition and your own mummy instinct. Yeah. Because you're relying on gadgets, you're not relying on you. Mm. And that's just really, really important. Um, there's always so it's, thing and there's always shoulds and opinions, but it's yeah. what sits with you. Yeah, yeah. You know? absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that is the end of my mess. Um, my final question really is after listening to this interview, what's one thing that you would like the women moms to take away from, from this? Yep. Um, what, what I. I <laughs> Really, really hard to do, but um, you guys put yourself first. Um, if if you don't look after you, you can't look after bubs. Yeah. Um, so it's um yeah, look after yourself first. Give yourself time. Um, find time in the day, even if it's just five minutes or ten minutes, to actually do something for you, so that you can actually reconnect with your baby um, on you know a much higher level, um, and, and and you've got more energy. Yeah, and don't give up what actually, you know, if there's something that you really, really enjoy doing before you had bubs, try and find some time to be able to do that even when you've become a new mum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people just lose their identity. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been great.